So I know many of you are wearing red because you knew today was Pentecost. And some of you may have walked in and were very surprised to find out that everybody else was wearing red because you did not know that today was Pentecost. So today, I do want to start off by talking about what Pentecost is. So Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit was given to the disciples after Jesus ascended into heaven. I am so sorry. Um, these are not the correct slides, so we can skip them. It's okay. I'll just talk. You've got your sermon outline in your bulletin if you want to follow along, so everything you would have seen on the screen will be in there. So now in verse 5 of what we just read, we saw that there were Jews from every nation in Jerusalem at this time. Now some of them lived there, but some of them were there to celebrate the festival of weeks. Now, in the Old Testament, there are lots of festivals that the Jews would celebrate. Two of those festivals were the, fest the Feast of First Fruits. Go ahead and say that five times fast. The Feast of First Fruits was celebrated after the harvest, where they sacrificed the first fruits or the um, first of their crop as a burnt offering. And then seven weeks afterwards, they celebrated the Feast of Weeks. This was in celebration of God's provision. Even though they had sacrificed some of their crop, they still had enough through God's provision. He provided what they needed. In fact, I love the definition, or it's not a definition, but kind of the explanation of God's provision from the Theology of Work Project. They said, we are meant to depend on God for provision, meaning that we should look to him to provide for us when our own means seem inadequate. I want you to remember that word today, inadequate. I don't think it was a coincidence that the Holy Spirit came to the disciples during a celebration of God's provision. When Jesus said that he was going away, the disciples thought that the ministry was done. So we're backing way up. This is pre-crucifixion. When Jesus said he was going to leave, they panicked because they thought the work that they had been doing was done. Jesus was supposed to do so much more. Now, in Acts 1, we were just in Acts 2, but now I'm going to be in Acts 1, 4 through 9. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. So this is post-resurrection. He said, do not leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, at the time, they understood the Messiah, the promised Savior, to be the one who was going to overthrow the Roman Empire. But that wasn't the plan just yet. But that's what they were expecting. They said, is, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. Now, when Jesus was crucified, like I said, the disciples were scared. The turning the culture upside down ministry that they had been following for years was coming to a crashing halt, or so they thought. And then what did Jesus do? Oof, yeah, thank you, Mary. We're going to try that again. What did Jesus do? He rose from the dead. That's right. So Jesus was crucified. This is big news, guys. Jesus was crucified, and then he rose from the dead. So now the disciples were like, great, let's go. And then Jesus said again, mm, no, I'm, I'm going for real this time. What an emotional roller coaster, Right? You follow this guy for three years, then he's killed, and then he comes back to life, and then he leaves you again. That's horrible. What torture. But Jesus promised that he wouldn't leave them on their own. He promised an advocate or a comforter. 
The spirit of truth would come to them. He promised that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And guess what? We are living in that promise right now. We're currently sitting approximately 7,361 miles from where the disciples received that promise. We are continents and oceans away from where the disciples received that promise. Folks, we are the ends of the earth. That promise came to fruition. They couldn't fathom what that meant at the time, but here we are living in it. I was listening to a podcast. Um, If you've ever watched me on Good News at Noon, you know I talk a lot about the She Reads Truth podcast. And there was a guest named Christine Kane. She's a pastor in Australia. And she had this quote. It's lengthy, but hear me out because it's really good. She said, when the Holy Spirit comes, you start seeing things you never saw. In this case, it was tongues of fire, right? There were tongues of fire over their heads and they had no idea what they were looking at. You start hearing God in ways you never heard and you start speaking in ways you never spoke. She said, to me, a sign in the day in which we live where there is so much noise out there. There's so much happening in social media and the news and just noise We're just saying what everyone is saying and we're seeing what everybody else is seeing and we're hearing what everyone else is hearing. But I'd like to challenge us as we go through the book of Acts. How about we start seeing what God is seeing? How about we start saying what God is saying and how about we start hearing through his word what God is saying to us all? So here is my challenge for you. Again, if you wanna take out your sermon outline, I've got some fill in the blanks for you so you don't forget. The first challenge is to look for God. Look for God. A few months ago, our senior high students did a study called How to See God. It was a devotion book all about the fruits of the Spirit and how we see God through these fruits or characteristics being expressed in our life and the lives of those around us. We find these fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22. Oh, you guys are awesome. Thank you. Go ahead and read this with me. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but those words definitely describe me, right? Like, we don't have any problems doing all of those things on our own, right? Like, who would describe themselves as patient? I didn't think so. Oh, we've got some patient people. Yes, I see you. I see you. Yes, we do have some people where patience is just in them. But listen, these things come from the Holy Spirit. If you're reading that list and you're like, ooh, I don't think I qualify, um, that's okay because it's the Holy Spirit's work in us that produces those fruits. I heard a wonderful quote. They said, we don't produce the fruits of the Spirit. God does. We just bear them. Much like a tree, the tree bears the fruit, but God produces it. And it's the Holy Spirit in us that produces this fruit so that the world around us can see God. And that's also where we see God. When we watch the news and we are on social media and all of these things, look for these things. Look for kindness and gentleness. Look for people using self-control and and having faithfulness that God will come through. That, friends, is where we see God. If you want to know how to look for God, how to see what God sees, when you wonder where God is in all of the mess and the noise in the world around us, look for the fruits of the Spirit in your life in your family members and your friends. 
You can even find these in your community and the world if you look hard enough. And pray that you can display these more often too so that the world around you can see God. The second challenge is to hear from God. If you were with me last time, I talked about this a little bit, but I want to remind you, I can't say it enough, friends, read your Bible. If you aren't reading God's word, you can't be surprised when he feels silent. If you aren't reading the words that God spoke, you can't be surprised if he feels silent. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The Bible, friends, yes, men, people, wrote it down physically, but it was the word of God through them. This is everything God ever wanted to say to us, and he's still speaking to us through prayer, through music, through other people, but if you are looking for what God is saying to you, I want you to start in your Bible because that is where it is. Even just the act of reading our Bible deepens our relationship with God and opens our heart to hear from him more clearly through the scripture, through prayer, and through his miraculous ways of getting our attention. God knows you. He knows how to speak to you, but we have to know him. In John 10, 27, Jesus said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. The closer you are in relationship with God, the more you know his voice. I would imagine there is somebody that if you picked up the phone and they said hello, you would recognize their voice, right? That is what we want with God. We want to be in that close of a relationship with him that when we hear from him, we know without a doubt that is God speaking to me. And the final challenge is to share God with others. Yes, this may seem obvious because that's our goal, right? To love God and love people and go out and make a difference. But I wanna take a moment to speak to those of you who may feel like God can't use you to do great things. Maybe he's done amazing things in your life, but you feel inadequate. You feel like you've messed up too much or your past disqualifies you. But when the people accused the disciples of being drunk in Acts 13, the, the, the disciples were speaking and they were speaking in languages they had never spoken before and I am sure they were thrilled. Can you imagine if you just started speaking and it, you had no idea what you were saying? This would be crazy. And all of these other people are looking at them and they're like, oh, they're just drunk. And then Peter stood up and he said, no, 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 here's what's happening. And he started preaching the gospel. Friends... This is the same Peter that just 40 days earlier denied even knowing Jesus. Had he fallen into the trap of guilt and shame over his past? Had he let his shortcomings define who he was instead of living into who God created him to be? His story would have stopped there. Christine Kane said again, she said, we're living in a cancel culture. Who's heard that phrase before, cancel culture? Yeah, too much, yes. We're living in a cancel culture. She said Peter would have been canceled immediately. She was like, there would have been blog posts, there would have been news, he would have been canceled. But what Peter understood is that Jesus canceled his sin on the cross and Jesus's cancellation is more powerful than any person's cancellation. The same truth is true for you. Regardless of what you have said or done, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can work not only in you, but through you to continue reaching the ends of the earth, even if that simply means the deepest, darkest corners of your heart or the heart of somebody that you love. And that is what Pentecost is all about whether you have been letting guilt or shame hold you back from sharing the gospel with others, or you simply feel underqualified because you haven't studied this or researched that. Fun fact, I did not go to Bible college, friends. 
You don't have to know the Bible or have all of the answers. We are celebrating the festival of weeks. We are celebrating God's provision. We're celebrating that he provides for us when our means, when our words or our knowledge or our finances or our history or our testimony feels inadequate. The spirit of God is powerful. The same God who created everything from nothing, who set the world into motion and implemented a centuries in the making plan of redemption for us. The same God who knit you together in your mother's womb with a purpose and for a purpose is calling and equipping you to share him with others. The power that defeated death and made a dead man walk again lives in you. I hope this week you look for God more intently. I hope you see him in places and situations that you hadn't before. I hope you hear from God that you immerse yourself in his word and open your heart to his voice. And I hope you share God I pray that you allow the Holy Spirit to work through you to advance his kingdom. And maybe, maybe in Acts 2, 36 through 41. This is Peter talking. He said, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Maybe because of the Holy Spirit's work through you, another will be added to that number. Please join me in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the chance to be together. Thank you for the chance to be in your presence among others who believe in you as well. While we feel comfortable and safe in this place, help us to go into the world and share you so that others can share in the joy and the peace and the love and the faithfulness and the gentleness and the self-control that we are able to experience through your power. Let us Feel the power of the Holy Spirit guiding us to those that you want us to talk to. Help us to recognize your voice and hear from you when you speak to us and help us to see you even in the darkest of places. In your name we pray, amen.